What's wrong with corporations controlling our food? Uh, the centralization of power is never a good idea, uh, no matter what you're talking about. Uh, you know, when you have, the, I'm just speaking about the centralization of power, period, whether it's governments or corporations. When you have a centralization of power, you also have a centralization in the uh, control of information, for example. So if our food supply rests in the hands of a very few companies, and something occurs that is negative for those companies, whether it's say like an E. coli outbreak or you know a cancer cluster or uh, people getting sick from eating a certain kind of food. If it's not in that company's interest for people to know about it, they will suppress that information. So you know there was a, a very famous story ten years ago or so where Oprah Winfrey, uh, in response to an yet one more outbreak of E. coli, got on her show and says, "I will never eat another hamburger," and she got sued. Believe it or not, these companies said that she was libeling food. Now, that was the first time, I mean, I teach journalism. I'd never heard of food being able to be libeled. Like, libel is about ruining a person's reputation. I didn't know that hamburgers had a reputation in terms of the Constitution, but apparently, uh, you know, this was up for debate. Now, thankfully, Oprah was really rich, and she won her case. But this is kind of a case in point. It's like, if someone gets up there and says something negative about hamburgers, and those companies can, are extremely rich and extremely politically powerful, and they don't want that information to be disseminated. They will squash it either through lawsuits or through threats or through media campaigns or whatever it is. So when you, when you concentrate control in the hands of very few players, there's no dissent. And you don't want that. I mean, not to get all philosophical here, but democracy, like by definition, is a collection of different voices. And if you have one voice that is shutting out everybody else, bad things happen. There's like a long historical record of that, whether you're talking about politics or you're talking about food. So you don't want, at the political level, you don't want everything concentrated in a few places. There are lots of other ways to talk about this, though, of course, which is like if you look at, as we said earlier, if the diet is based on basically two grains, corn and soybeans, there used to be hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of foods out there. So, like, our diet is not benefiting from having the concentration. Our, the environment is not. There, there are 200 million acres of corn and soybeans. And that's 200 million acres fewer forests and fewer broccoli crops and fewer carrots and apples and everything else. All that stuff has been wiped away to create this tiny, tiny concentration of stuff. So it doesn't work politically. It doesn't work nutritionally. It doesn't work environmentally. Like, it works at no level. There's nothing to balance that power. I mean, balance of power is... It's not only a, a politically desirable thing, balance is actually the way nature works. Nature doesn't, you know, left to itself, nature doesn't say, hmm, you know what I think we should have? All corn. Like, that's just not the way it works. Like, people should be much more interested in mimicking the way the natural world works, not trying to control it to suit our own corporate ends. That's the opposite of the way nature works. Uh, so, a lot of people wonder why everyone's worked, about, worked up about GMOs, because they must be safe because somebody in the government must have approved them or must have tested them. Um, and it's a very important thing for people to understand that uh, government agencies are very large. Uh, and whether Republicans or Democrats are in office, uh, sometimes they want those agencies to be bigger, sometimes they want them to be smaller. But whether they're big or small, they're still enormous. And they are run, that is to say, they are uh, organized and directed by political appointees. So, you know, whether you're talking about the EPA, the USDA, the FDA, these are giant bureaucracies that have many career scientists working for them at, at the middle and lower levels. But at the top, they have people appointed by the, whoever happens to be the president. So the director of the EPA, the director of the USDA, these are people that are appointed by political people. So who is a president going to appoint to run these agencies which are responsible for protecting our food and our water and our chemicals and everything else? Well, the president gets into office and he's got all these agencies he's got to appoint people to. Well, who is going to tell him 
Where's he going to get his recommendations about who to appoint? He's going to get his recommendations from the industries that are regulated by these companies. So if you have a company that makes chemicals, they're going to want their guy appointed to the head of the regulatory. So if you've got a company that makes food, you're going to want their guy appointed to the USDA. This happens regardless of who's in office, whether it's a liberal Democrat or a conservative Republican. They come into office and the companies come in and they tell them who to appoint. Because the president doesn't know everybody, like he just knows a few people. Everyone else is telling him who to appoint. So the problem with this regulatory system we have, because it's politically determined, is that you have people in charge that don't have consumers' interests at heart, they have companies' interests at heart. So I wrote a book called Poison Spring a few years ago with a guy who used to work at the EPA. And he pulled a thousand different documents out of the EPA over the course of 25 years. And it was like completely evident that from like like in his case, from like the early Reagan administration all the way through Obama, the EPA was d dictated to at every level by co the corporations they were supposed to be regulating. So this idea that, that these government regulators are somehow looking out for regular people is, uh, is unfortunately a myth. I mean, the scientists are trying to do the best they can. And what's really aggravating about this is these scientists do really great research, and then they come up and they'll say things like, you know, we've done all these studies, and it turns out that this, this chemical is really dangerous. And they'll say, I think we should tell the public. And then the people at the top say, no. And they bury it, or they kill it, or they defund it, or they move those researchers around so it never gets out. So the problem is that you've got scientists doing good work and political appointees that are squashing the science so then the public never gets to hear about it. So, you know, the conservative political voice says we want to deregulate, meaning they don't trust government to regulate business. They would like business to regulate itself. That's a bad idea because business doesn't regulate itself. The liberals want government to regulate things, which seems fine, except that the, even with the liberal administrations, you still have corporate people at the top of these agencies. If you look at the way that the revolving door works between corporations and these, it's just like a constant merry-go-round. So this idea that anybody is looking out for our best interests is really, it's, it's uh, misplaced confidence, let's say. So as we've spoken about before, uh, this incredibly uh, dense and long-term reliance on glyphosate, Roundup, has meant the decreasing effectiveness of Roundup. So what companies are doing now is creating what are called stacked herbicides, which are they're taking two four, or a, a round, a glyphosate and then adding another chemical called, for example, 2,4-D. 2,4-D used to be a component of Agent Orange. So now you can buy a stacked herbicide that has both uh, and use that because now we are going to ramp up the effectiveness of this now compound chemical. Um, this is just another you know, unintended but logical consequence of the resistance to glyphosate. You're starting to get these layers of more toxic chemicals to, to be used by farmers. And, and uh, you know, they were, the regulator said, these are fine because we've already had 2,4-D in the market. We've already had glyphosate on the market. So what could possibly be the problem of stacking them up? Uh, this just goes back to my earlier point that the chemicals we're using are becoming more and more acute and more and more toxic. This is a really great question. So um, if GMOs are in virtually all the food that we eat, and yet nobody knows that, one of the big pushes by food activists is to put a label on food that says, this food contains GMOs. And the reason that activists are doing that is because the term GMO has become a toxic term. Like people whether they know anything about GMOs or not, they have this weird or kind of intuitive sense that it must mean that things are bad. It's like, you know, in the 70s, the term MSG, like you went to eat Chinese food, if it had MSG, you didn't want to eat it. You didn't even know what it was, you just didn't want to eat it. So the labeling question is really interesting because there are lots of words that are attached to packages of food. Some of them are legally required, most of them are not. So for example, if you see the word natural on your whatever it is, your cereal, it has no meaning. It is a marketing term. There's no legal terminology. If you see the word organic, it is a legal term. Like that, or the word organic is one of the very few things that has legal power, which means that this product was made with no synthetic 
chemicals. So labels mean things to people. So food activists have decided rightly that the term GMO is a, is a negative marketing label. So they, because they don't like GMOs, would like to force companies to put a GMO label on all food. Now companies, knowing that the word GMO is toxic, don't want this label. So they are pouring millions and millions of dollars. Whenever there's a state like California or Vermont or whoever it is that says we want to label food, they pour millions of dollars saying no, 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 no. And so far they've been successful. What's happened instead of that is that companies voluntarily are putting non-GMO labels on their products because they know that non-GMO is the opposite of a toxic. It's a draw. So you buy cereal and it says non-GMO, you're like, oh good, I don't, I don't want GMOs, I'll buy this. So what's interesting about that is that you know, whenever you're fighting things, there's always like the political game and then there's like the marketing game or the, the, uh, the, the consumer game. So you can either play this game at the political level or you can play it at the marketing level. So the political game is where the power has been for these food companies, and they squash it and squash it and squash it. The marketing campaign, if you're a little startup company and you put non-GMO and suddenly people start buying it, that's a way to take market share away from these big companies. This is what happened with the organic food movement. You know, people are suddenly like buying organic, you know, or not just organic produce, but organic spaghetti sauce or organic wine or whatever it is, and now that's, that's starting to cut into the profits of the regular companies. What's funny and weird about this is now that you can have a big company that makes, for example, Cheerios, and they can say, Cheerios, non-GMO, and they'll be right on the shelf next to Honey Nut Cheerios, which does not say non-GMO. So you're a, you know, a parent walking down the supermarket, and you're like, which one do you pick? And the company has to make this calculation like, okay, so if we sell the non-GMO product and that cuts away from some of the regular GMO product, that's okay because we're still selling something. But what happens if we start losing market share to our own products. Like it's very complicated for them. So the labeling question is a very interesting one. And I, I also will say one, one further thing. Uh, and I will tell you that, that this is the kind of thing that my book is really about, which is about things that are way beyond just the question of GMOs. So let's say you would like to know more about your food. The fact that you don't know anything about your food is itself revealing about where we are in the world. Like there have only been like three or four generations of human beings on the planet that didn't know where their food came from. We just happen to be one of them. Like it used to be, think about your grandparents or some, maybe your great grandparents. Somebody in your recent family history either was a farmer or knew a farmer. Everyone was like that. And then suddenly we have generations where nobody knows a farmer, can't even find a farm on a map. So therefore our ignorance about food is like complete. And people don't like that because, you know, they, they buy something, they don't really know where it came from, they, so they would like some information about it. This is also part of the labeling question. So if you would like to know more about your food and you can't find a farm to save your life, the best you can hope for is something that's on the package. So what would you like on that package? Like, what would you like to know about your food? Is the, whether or not it's a GMO, is that all you want to know? Like, what w would you like to know like how the workers were treated at the farm or how the animals were treated at the farm? Or, you know, let's say, you know, yuppies these days, they love to eat almonds. Almonds is a big thing. Everyone's eating almonds. Would you like to know that almond plantations in California uh, are some of the most water intensive crops on the planet? So like to eat a single nut, one nut, one single almond requires a gallon of fresh water. Let's say you eat 40 almonds a day. That's 40, that's like a bathtub full of fresh water that you ate because you like almonds. Would you like that to be on the label? Like, would you like to know that growing almonds is a very water intensive crop? And maybe you're like, you know, actually the, the biggest problem in the world is the, sh the decline in drinking water. So maybe almonds is a complicated thing to eat. Like, wh what is it that you want to know? So there are people, and th this is true of pro-GMO and anti-GMO people that said, you want a label? The label's going to have to be like 10 feet long. Because food is complicated and we don't know anything about it, so what is it that you want to know? It can't really just be about GMOs. So I think the labeling conversation is more complicated and more interesting than either side makes it. If you have a food product and you poke your phone at it and suddenly all these videos come up to tell you everything you want to know, how the workers are treated, how the animals are treated, how the soil is treated, where their chemicals are used, all of it. That might seem like a crazy, like futuristic, postmodern, yuppie thing, which it 
is because it's all digital. But what it also is is simply a digital reflection of the way it used to be, which is you want to know what your food is like, you walk down and you ask the farmer. So it's digital, but it's also weirdly like retro because, you know, the reason you can't go down the street and ask your farmer how he's growing his food is because you don't have a farmer anymore. If you did, you would, and you wouldn't need all this technology. So it's a crazy kind of back to the future thing where we're trying to like reproduce what used to be true for everybody. The weird thing about this, human beings have been farming for about 10,000 years. Before that, we were hunter-gatherers for a very long time. And on a clock, if you take all of human existence as a 24-hour clock, we've been farming at all for about six minutes. So for 23 hours and 54 minutes, we were running around hunting and gathering fruits and nuts and whatever. Then six minutes ago, we decided to farm, which is to say 10,000 years ago. So if 10,000 years equals six minutes, what percentage of 10,000 years is this whole GMO industrial food thing? We're talking about 50 or 60 years. We're talking about like a flash of time. And we don't have any idea what we're doing. I mean, we think we do because we're all geeky about science and we think science is like religion or something. But the fact is this is a, a in the scale of things, is a brand new and completely unprecedented thing. So when everyone said, anybody says, I know that this stuff is safe or I know that this stuff is beneficial, you know, on its face, you can say that's just completely unknowable because it's all brand new. I think we just had the Super Bowl thing. What, what is the Super Bowl? The Super Bowl is a bunch of guys on a field to get you to watch an endless stream of ads for Coke and Doritos and, you know, Jeeps and whatever else. It's just, a, it, you know, we live in a world where everybody is competing for our attention so they can sell us stuff. That's like, it's, we've become like a country of consumers and like uh, wallets with legs, you know. So everybody's marketing, pushing, 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 trying to get us. And it's like really difficult to figure out like with all this noise trying to get us to buy stuff, like what to do. So, I mean, that's a much bigger can of worms. It's not just food, it's everything. But that's, that's where we are. Mm -hmm.